Hi everyone, my name is Emron, I'm based at UCL. In general, I'm interested in how cognitive factors affect the ability to understand speech in noisy environments. And today I'm going to talk about how people direct selective attention in these environments and some work we've done to examine how it's expected by hearing loss across the lifespan. So in our everyday lives, we're often faced with the challenge of understanding speech when other sounds are present. And we know that these noisy situations are particularly difficult for people with hearing loss. Most previous research has focused on peripheral factors that might contribute to this difficulty, but we know that understanding speech in noisy places also requires a variety of cognitive processes. And one of the processes important for understanding speech in natural environments where sounds originate from different directions is spatial attention. And so we want to examine whether differences in spatial attention might contribute to difficulties understanding speech in noisy environments for people with hearing loss. So first I'll talk about spatial attention in listeners with normal hearing. Then I'll describe some work we did with children who had early onset hearing loss to examine how hearing loss at an early age affects spatial attention. Then I'll skip to the other end of the lifespan to examine how spatial attention changes with older age and whether it's affected by age related hearing loss. So if someone with normal hearing is trying to listen to someone speak in a noisy environment, they can direct spatial attention based on where that person is. So if you're trying to listen to this person here, you might know that that person's located to your right, so you might direct your attention to sounds on your right side and that will help you to focus on that person's voice. In the lab, spatial attention has typically been studied by presenting simple cues that tell people to attend to sounds on the left or right side. So if you imagine a typical experimental situation here where the listener's in the centre of an array of loudspeakers, they hear three different phrases spoken by three different people from different locations in front of them. We can tell them in advance which voice they should listen to by presenting a visual cue that appears on the screen in front of them. For example, they might see a leftward pointing arrow which would tell them to listen to the talker on their left. And in this situation, the correct answer would be white one. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that these instructive visual cues are beneficial. People with normal hearing are better at reporting speech when they receive these cues before the speech starts than when they don't get a cue at all, or when that cue occurs after the talkers have started speaking. So these results imply that people with normal hearing are using spatial cues to actively prepare their attention before the speech begins. In a previous experiment, we showed that the length of time that people have to prepare spatial attention affects their performance. In this experiment, we manipulated the length of time that the visual cue was on the screen before the talker started speaking, or in other words, the length of time participants had to prepare for the upcoming talker. The length of the preparation interval is shown on the x-axis of this graph and the y-axis shows participants reaction times for reporting words that were spoken by the target talker. At zero on the x-axis this would be a condition where the cue is shown at the same time as the talkers start speaking. And we found that reaction times get progressively better as participants have longer to prepare for the location of the target talker. And we know that while the visual cues on the screen before the talkers start speaking, participants show preparatory brain activity. Using fMRI, Hill and Miller showed that when participants prepare spatial attention, they activate areas of the superior temporal sulcus. These areas overlap with parts of the brain that are active when participants listen to the talkers and selectively attend to different spatial locations. So in other words, when participants see these visual cues, they're actively preparing the neural circuitry that they use to attend to spatial location. We also found that this preparatory activity can be measured with EEG. So here the red line on the plot shows a condition where participants prepare to attend to a talker at a particular location, like in the experiments I've shown you. The blue line then shows a control condition where participants see the same visual stimuli, but they're not cues for attention. And at these central electrodes highlighted in blue, we found a significant difference between the two conditions, demonstrating that participants prepared spatial attention before the talker started speaking. And the scalp distribution here is consistent with predominantly auditory cortex generators. So next we wanted to know whether listeners with hearing loss show similar preparatory attention as listeners with normal hearing as indexed by this preparatory EEG activity. So first I just want to quickly want to mention why did we think that hearing loss might impair spatial attention? Well there's evidence that hearing loss originating in the inner ear distorts the representation of the temporal fine structure of sounds. And the temporal fine structure refers to these rapid fluctuations in the sounds like you can see in the tone on this slide. And so you can think of this as a loss of sensory precision. And we know that information about spatial location at least partially relies on information that's contained in the temporal fine structure of sounds. And we also know that listeners with normal hearing use these cues to segregate speech from competing sounds. 
So if someone has impaired hearing, they might not have access to these cues for segregating sounds, which may mean that they can't focus their attention on such a precise spatial location. If we consider a visual analogy, then we can think of someone trying to read the words in this image when several of the words overlap. And the fact that these words are in different colours helps us to read each word individually. But someone who's colourblind might not have access to these colour cues, so the words might blend into each other and they might be more difficult to read. And so we wondered whether something similar might happen with people with hearing loss hear speech when competing speech is present. Our research question was whether people with hearing loss struggle to selectively attend to speech when other sounds are present. And to start with, we focused on children aged 7 to 15 years who had early onset hearing loss. So in this task, the participant sees a visual cue that tells them which talker to attend to, for example, the left or the right talker. They then hear three simultaneous phrases from three different loudspeakers, and they have to press a button to indicate the colour and the number of words they heard spoken by the target talker. And the neat thing about this task is it allows us to measure one aspect of attention, preparatory attention, independently of acoustic input. If we were to measure EEG activity while participants were listening to the talkers, then any differences in EEG activity between children with and without hearing loss could be due to impaired selective attention, but it could also just be due to differences processing sounds at the ear. Whereas here during this preparatory phase, we're measuring brain activity in response to a visual cue for attention before any acoustic simile start. And this allows us to isolate whether children with hearing loss show atypical attention beyond differences at the ear. For each participant, we also ran a control condition, and in the control condition, we presented identical visual stimuli, but this time they didn't have any implications for attention. Here, participants' task was just to indicate the stimulus that was presented on each trial. We presented noise recoded stimuli that were acoustically similar to the main conditions, but were unintelligible, and that was just to keep the trial structure as similar as possible. And so we use the difference in EEG activity between the two conditions while the visual stimulus was on the screen to index preparatory attention in each participant. So here I'm going to first show you the patterns of EEG activity in children with normal hearing. And we ran a spatiotemporal cluster-based permutation analysis, which essentially searches for groups of electrodes and time points that display significantly different activity between our two conditions. On these plots, the visual cue is revealed at zero milliseconds and the acoustic simile began at 2000 milliseconds. So here we're just looking at the preparatory phase. And we found differences between the test and control conditions throughout most of the preparatory phase. This first cluster that you can see here emerged with early latency after the visual cue was revealed and lasted for approximately 200 milliseconds. We also found significant preparatory activity during the second half of the cue period, just before the talker started speaking. You can see that activity during the control condition is basically a baseline here, and the preparatory activity is significantly more negative. This occurred in posterior electrodes with a very similar scalp distribution, as you can see in the first cluster, and the event-related potential here somewhat resembles the contingent negative variation, which is often observed in anticipation of an expected event. Complementary to this cluster, we found a significant reversal of polarity in the anterior electrodes here. And overall, these results demonstrate that children with normal hearing are preparing their attention for the location of an upcoming talker throughout most of the time that the visual cue is on the screen. When we ran the same analysis in our children with hearing loss, we found no significant clusters during the preparatory phase, suggesting that as a group they don't display reliable preparatory EEG activity. We next wanted to directly compare children with, that, with and without hearing loss, so we took the clusters that we identified in our normally hearing children, which are shown on the top here, and we tested the magnitude of EEG activity against that of the children with hearing loss at the same electrodes and time windows. And so in all of the three clusters, we found significantly smaller or weaker preparatory activity in the hearing impaired children. The results that you're seeing here were obtained when the hearing impaired children performed the task without their hearing aids. But we also got them to come back a second time and repeat the experiment using their own hearing aids. Interestingly, we found no significant difference between the preparatory EEG activity measured when the same children perform the task with and without their hearing aids. And to check that this is statistically robust, we can also compare that data against the data from the normally hearing children. And in two out of the three clusters, the hearing aid data was reliably weaker than the data from the normally hearing children. And so together, these results demonstrate that preparatory EEG activity is not restored by hearing aids. Now, an interesting question that arises is whether age-related hearing loss produces similar reductions in preparatory attention. 
Now, if hearing loss impairs selective attention directly because it degrades the cues that people rely on for directing spatial attention, then we might expect that hearing loss at any age would impair selective attention in a similar way. On the other hand, older adults have lots of prior experience of sounds before they experience hearing loss, and it's possible that this experience could be utilised to direct proprietary attention despite hearing loss. In a similar way to if someone loses a limb, then they may retain some of the neural circuitry for initiating movements in that limb. People with hearing loss may retain the neural circuitry for directing selective attention. So in that case, people with age-related he age hearing loss should show similar selective attention as participants with normal hearing. Or perhaps they could even use selective attention to a greater extent to help compensate for their hearing loss. So in a behavioural study we recently conducted, we investigated how age and the degree of age-related hearing loss relate to proprietary spatial attention. We recruited two groups of participants, one was aged 18 to 35 years and the other 55 to 80 years. We weren't recruiting a clinical sample, so we expected to find quite a variety of audiometric thresholds in each group. And we took an individual differences approach to utilise this variability to examine how spatial attention relates to audiometric thresholds. As you can see from the plots here, there was some variability within each group, although more so in the older group who had worse thresholds overall, as we would expect. We measured proprietary spatial attention in a similar way as the previous experiments I described. One of the main differences is that this, is that this time we simulated spatial locations through headphones using interaural time differences. On each trial, participants first saw a fixation cross on the screen in front of them. Next, they saw an uninformative visual stimulus, which is a combination of a leftwards and a rightwards pointing arrow. Participants then saw the instructional cue that told them to attend to the talker on their left or right side. And then they heard the three phrases spoken by three different talkers, and these were presented from different locations, simulated using ITDs. So one of the talkers was simulated to come from the left, one from the middle, and the third from the right. And participants had to select the colour and the number of words they heard spoken in the target sentence. We had two conditions in the experiment which consist of a longer or a shorter preparatory interval. So the spatial cue was either presented for 2000 milliseconds before the talker started speaking, or 100 milliseconds. It's important to note that the duration of time between the fixation cross and the start of the acoustic simile was always fixed in both conditions, so that any differences between conditions can't be explained simply by differences in the predictability of the acoustic stimuli. Thinking back to the behavioural experiment I described at the beginning, we're essentially taking a subset of the conditions, so the longest interval and also one of the shortest intervals. And so we can evaluate the extent to which proprietary spatial attention is beneficial for participants by comparing performance with the longer versus the shorter proprietary interval. We use the method of constant stimuli here, so we varied the target to mask ratio across trials between minus 18 and plus 18 decibels, and this allowed us to map out the psychometric functions for each of our queuing conditions. Here you can see the accuracy results for the two groups. The y-axis shows the proportion of trials in which participants reported the correct colour and number words from the target sentence, target to mask ratios on the x-axis, and you can see we get a nice psychometric function in both groups as we go from very negative target to mask ratios to positive target to mask ratios, as we would expect. The blue line on each plot shows performance in the shorter preparation time condition, and the red line shows performance in the longer preparation time condition. You can see that while the two lines on each plot are quite close together, the red line does seem to be slightly higher than the blue line. On the right, I'm now showing the reaction times for each group on trials where the participant responded correctly. And again, while the red and the blue lines on each plot are quite close together, the red line is slightly lower than the blue line, indicating better reaction times in the longer queuing condition. It's worth noting that though the differences between conditions were smaller than expected, especially for the younger group, where we have previous data on this showing a larger effect, that this could potentially be because we simulated location with ITDs here, rather than presenting the simile in the free field as we did previously. But importantly, what we wanted to do in this study was to quantify the benefit in each group, and we did this by calculating the area between the curves for the two conditions, and so that's what I'm going to show you on the next slide. So here the younger and the older participants are shown on the same plot. The y-axis shows the area between the curves, in other words, the benefit of proprietary spatial attention. And on the left, we're looking at accuracy here. The separate bars show the mean and the standard deviations for the younger and older groups, and the individual dots show the results from individual participants. So when considering the accuracy of responses, the area between the curves was significant for both groups, 
and there was no significant difference between the two groups, suggesting that the two groups got a similar benefit overall from longer spatial cues. For reaction times, the area between the curves is again significant in both groups. However, unlike the accuracy results, the difference between the groups is also significant, with older adults getting a larger benefit to reaction times than the younger group. So overall, we found that as a group, older adults get at least as much benefit from preparatory spatial attention as younger adults do, and perhaps an even greater benefit to reaction times. Next, we wanted to know whether individual differences in the magnitude of the benefit within each group relates to participants' audiometric thresholds. So the plots on this slide show the area between the curves on the y-axis and the pure tone average audiogram at 4 to 8 kilohertz on the x-axis. And for the older group, we found that the benefit to accuracy and the benefit to reaction times were significantly smaller for people who had worse audiometric thresholds. And this finding is consistent with the idea that hearing loss relates directly to the amount of benefit that people get from having time to prepare spatial attention. So this demonstrates that even though preparatory spatial attention is preserved in older adults with normal hearing, it's impaired by age-related hearing loss. And this is somewhat similar to the results we found in children with early onset hearing loss. So together, our results suggest that regardless of the age at which someone acquires hearing loss, it weakens their ability to direct preparatory spatial attention to speech when competing speech is present. So this is likely to be one factor that contributes to difficulties listening in noisy environments. I just wanted to finish with a quick mention of our modelling work, which I think can help us to interpret these types of findings. So in the work I've presented to you today, we've sometimes measured the behavioural benefit from preparatory spatial attention, and other times we've measured neural activity during the preparatory phase of the task. And until recently, we assumed that these two different measures reflect similar underlying processes. That is, that the neural activity we measured during the spatial cueing period directly affects the extent to which people benefit from spatial cues. But our modelling work suggests that two dissociable processes might actually underpin these different benefits. And so essentially what this means is that someone who prepares neural activity to a greater extent isn't necessarily going to gain a greater behavioural benefit from this preparation. And that's something we might be able to see in some recent data we've collected from older adults in a preparatory spatial attention task. And I've put the reference to this modelling paper on the slide if you'd like to read more about it. So to conclude, we know that hearing loss degrades the ability to direct preparatory spatial attention to speech of interest. I've shown you that children with early onset hearing loss show weaken your preparation following spatial cues and do children without hearing loss. And I've also shown you that older adults who have age-relating hearing loss benefit less from spatial cues, although aging by itself does not seem to reduce the benefit. So I'd just like to finish by thanking the people who contributed to the work, thanking the funders, and thank you for listening.